in Genesis 39, where we're at. We're almost to the point where we're only 10 chapters away. You know, it seems like a, seems like a long time, but you know, you keep on, keep on going and eventually you get there. So Genesis 39, and I'm not sure what I did here in my notes. I put the recap and only wrote one sentence. I, thought, I don't know what I was thinking, but anyway, the recap for last week it was kind of like a little interlude story between, uh, from the story of Joseph. Uh, there in chapter 38, we saw uh, the story of Judah and Tamar. Uh, we saw how um, Judah married a Canaanite woman, and uh, she wasn't, didn't appear to be a good woman, and uh, she had, her sons weren't very good people, and then one of the sons went and married uh, Tamar. And then all of a sudden, the oldest son died, and then the way the custom goes and is that the, the next brother in line is supposed to take up the marriage commitment, if you will, of the, of the older brother that just died and have children by, by his wife, so the name would be carried on. So what ended up happening is, well, the, the other brother didn't do it. You know, it says that he didn't live up to that commitment, and then the Lord killed him for it. So there you got two of the three brothers died uh, in the commitment or arrangement of marriage with this woman. So then you have Sheila, Judah's, young, Judah's youngest son. Uh, he tried to put Tamar away and said, hey, I'll come get you when Sheila's old enough, then he can carry on this, this custom that we have. And um, as time went on, Tamar felt like she was being forgotten because she saw Sheila and says, man, he's old enough to be married now, but Judah's still leaving me here. Uh, you know, kind of put away. So she put on, she put off her widow's garments, the Bible says, and she put on the garments of a prostitute. And it's not really clear what her intention was to try to draw Sheila in, you know, in the way there when they were going um, after Judah's wife died. It says that they went to go uh, to a sheep shearing, which is kind of like a party or celebration, if you will, just to kind of, you know, uh, go to places, you know, having a little bit of fun. And it says in the way there, Tamar was sitting dressed as a prostitute. And um, again, we don't know what her intention was. But anyway, Judah's the one that, that, took the bait, I guess you want to look at it that way, and then, um, then she got pregnant, right? And so that, that's kind of how the whole story went, and that's also how the, the lineage of Christ is kept going there from t- the, the union of Tamar and Judah. Um, so we'll continue on here in uh, chapter 39. This week we continue with the story of Joseph. Uh, last we heard of Joseph in chapter 38, or excuse me, chapter 37, is that he was sold off, remember, by his brothers. And they went and told uh, Jacob, Joseph's dad, that, you know, Joseph's been killed. You know, so now Jacob thinks Joseph's dead. He's in mourning. And now here Joseph is, had been sold off. So that's where we pick up our story. Let's look at there. Genesis 39 and verse 1. It says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of, uh, of the Ishmaelites, which had, brought, uh, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So we see here, it's an interesting thing that I like to look at is when we see what the Lord does for us, and we can see a summation of Joseph's life in this phrase that says, the Lord was with Joseph. We see that many times in the life of Joseph, that the Lord was with them. And what a great statement that can be made about even any of us. You know, the Lord was with us. And it's not saying that, that there's a time when he's not with us. But it's something that's almost like a reminder. The Lord's saying, hey, the Lord was with them. And we're going we're gonna to see the, the ups and downs of Joseph's life. And then we're also going to see that, that the Lord was with them uh, throughout all those times. So, you know, the Lord being with Joseph didn't spare him from being hated by his brothers, did it? Remember, his brothers hated him to the point of just wanting to kill him. And, and the only person that, that kind of stood up for Joseph was who? It was Reuben, right? And then you had someone said, well, let's just make a little bit of money on the side, right? So they, they just, let's just sell Joseph instead of killing him off. Right, so it, the Lord being with Joseph didn't save him from the hatred of his brothers. Right, another thing you say here, I put in the notes, it didn't spare him from being tempted. Right, some as we know, temptation come on us times. I mean, it can be very strong. It, 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 it seemingly is takes almost all the strength that you have just to just to resist it many times. You know, I've heard of uh, uh, people that have dealt with addiction to, to to drugs, heroin especially, alcohol, and things like that. They they say that they actually drive out of the way because the temptation is so strong to even drive by a liquor store. They say the temptation is so strong that whenever they go out, whenever they drive somewhere, they go out of their way to make sure that they don't ever pass by a liquor store because just the look of it, man, it can draw them in. I mean, imagine having an addiction like that. You know, I I mean, I I can't imagine that, but you know, I've heard testimonies of it. You know, uh, test. Uh, addiction to drugs and things like that. You know, people just giving up their health and their entire livelihood, families even, and, and just to, to go get some drugs, you know, just that, that addiction. But be, the Lord being with Joseph didn't spare him from these things, but didn't spare him from being sold into slavery or being wrongfully accused. And I wrote there, the Christian life, it doesn't make you immune to problems. We know this. If you've been a Christian more than a couple of days, you know, my goodness, there are problems that abound out there. And let's look at some verses here I wrote down. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13. 
in verse 5. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. We'll, we'll just see some other places, you know, that, that, um, where it talks about the Lord is with us. Hebrews 13, 5 says, let, um, excuse me, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know, if, if you lose everything in the world, if you lose your, your home, your car, your clothes, everything, and you have nothing left, even maybe just even no pain, no, nothing to even buy bread with to, to eat. You know, it says what, what this verse here is saying, it says just be content because of that saying, the promises the Lord gave us. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, now, you put yourself in Joseph's shoes, you know, his brother's hating him. You know, that shock, remember Joseph was just going to check on his brothers in that, in that part of the story. He was walking around the field, he went and finally found them. You can imagine the, uh, the, one of the youngest brothers going up and just kind of being happy to see his older brothers. And all of a sudden they grab him, they, they mistreat him horribly. And even while he is, he is pleading with them for them to save him and not to sell him, guess what, they went ahead and sold him. Amidst all his pleadings, you know, hey, you know, don't do this, you know, why are you doing this? People that, that I'm surely that, that he loved, you know, looked up to. And amidst all this, guess what? That promise still held true that the Lord will, is with us. The, the verse here says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. How in the world does that, how, how does that hold true? You could ask the Lord. How does that hold true, God? You know, look at all these horrible things that are happening. Let's look at Psalms 27 um, and verse uh, 9. And if you don't want to turn, you just want to listen. It's fine too, of course. Psalm 27 and verse 9. This is uh, David saying, he says, Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. And this is just a prayer from David. Of course, we know that, that, that the Lord's not going to leave us, but, but David knows and, uh, that it sounds like he's just uh, in a place, if you will, of, of just needing the Lord. He's asking the Lord, don't leave me, don't forsake me, is what he's saying. And of course, we know that promise holds true. Right, let's look at one more, John 16.33. And the reason I bring up, you know, there was many more verses that I could have pulled up for this. But the reason I wanted to pull up a few is that this is a promise that's made throughout scriptures. It's not something that's, that should be a foreign concept, if you will. John 16, says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And the reason I brought this up was, you know, again, just because the Lord is walking with us and because he doesn't leave us nor forsake us doesn't mean we're not going to have problems. Right, it's something to always remember. Many times, and it's kind of sad when new Christians they'll come to the Lord and and uh, you know they say, well, let me try going to church for a while and let's see what happens. You know, last time I went to the church, maybe I had a bad experience. I don't know. You can apply the story to, to many out there. And they'll go to church again because maybe they they've run into some big problems. You know, I need to start going to church again because because eh, I just, this life out here ain't working out so well. So they'll go to church for a couple months. Guess what? The Lord didn't give them help them win the lottery. So guess what they do? Man, this this the Lord's not really with me. I'm just going to leave. You know, that they think God should, is like their little genie, if you will. I know we've heard that expression, that any time we go to him, he's supposed to just fix all our problems, right? Uh, as a father, one thing I've really understood more is, is that, you know, sometimes letting your kids deal with certain things helps them learn not to do it again. You know, the first couple of times, Ariel liked to crawl up on the, uh, we have this like, um, uh, well, it's, it's not a chest, but it's kind of like this thing where you, it's a wooden thing you put stuff in. We put like blankets and quilts in it so when we get cold. Chest. There you go, something like that. It's the exact same thing. So we, we'll pull out the blankets sometimes and we'll just, you know, cover up or whatever. But that's where they kind of stay. Angela's knitting materials is in there and things like that. So uh, sometimes Ariel likes to crawl up on top of it. You know, in the first couple of times, hey, get Ariel, get her off of there. She's going to fall off. You know, but you know, I've, how many times we tell her not to get up there, right? And there's a rug underneath it. So I don't think she's not falling, you know, on the concrete or anything. But, you know, there's been a couple of times where I see her crawling up there and I just like, you know what? She's going to learn eventually, you know, and she'll slip off and, you know, kind of fall off of it. You know, cry a little bit. You know, she doesn't really, she's a lot more careful when she goes climbing on things now. But at the same time, you know, the Lord's the same way with us. He doesn't just pull us out of our problems that just because, you know, because there's, there's, many, there's so much wisdom to be gained from, from dealing with hard tribulations and trials. You know, James talks about that. It's, a, it's an exercise of our faith. So again, going back to that statement, just because the Lord is with us, or even here, we, just because the Lord was with Joseph, it didn't spare him from all these, tri these trials and tribulations that he went through. Let's look at verse, th verse 3 here. It says, And his master saw that the Lord was with them, and that the Lord made all that he did to, to prosper in his hand. One thing that's interesting here, it says the master even noticed it. 
The master noticed there was something different about Joseph. And it, it doesn't say the master recognized that there's something supernatural about Joseph. Or there's something different about him. The master recognized that the Lord was with Joseph. The master knew that, you know what, there's, there's, God is with this young man. Right? Let me, let, let me just let him do what he's going to do while he's here. And, and continue on in verse 4, it says, And Joseph found grace in his sight, in the master's sight. And he served him, and he made him overseer over his house. And all that he, uh, all that he had, he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. Verse 6 says, And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So what is going on here is saying this master, he, he trusts jo- he Firstly, he recognized that the Lord was with Joseph in a great way. And he says, you know what, if I want to prosper, if I want the Lord to continue to bless him, there's this young man, right? Maybe the Lord's blessed me with this young man to come into my house. And I'm just going to make your overseer over all my stuff, right? And of course, we know how things work. He didn't just say, oh, the Lord's with this guy. Let me dump all my possessions onto him. He didn't, you know, it's probably a gradual thing. You know, he saw that Joseph handled this very well. Let me give him a couple more things to be responsible for and, and things like that. But eventually, Joseph was overseer over all this man's house. And it, it said that it came to the point where this man, he didn't even recognize, he, he didn't even realize how much possessions he had. He was increasing. He didn't even keep track of it because he knew Joseph was taking care of it. And it says there in verse 6, the only thing he was really worried about was, you know, what, what do I feel like eating today? You know, it says all he was worried about there was, um, uh, it says he, and he knew not odd what he had, save the bread which he did eat. He didn't even care about anything except, he, you know, he just knew I'm eating good. Joseph's taking care of everything else. You know, life is good. This, this uh, Egyptian um, over, uh, person is, you know, he's just happy that Joseph's there. And this verse here, this um, phrase in verse 6 says, um, And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. It basically means Joseph was a very good person. He wasn't like a, 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 a tyrant overseer, if you will. You know, he did, he did just a good person. Everybody liked him. And it says he was a goodly, per, uh, well favored there, which means he's a very good looking guy, right? So he was, everybody liked him. He's a good looking guy, makes it easier, right? And he was just doing very well in overseeing this Egyptian's house. Verse 7 says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. You know, here, here we have a great temptation. Now, how old is Joseph about this time? He's about early 20s, right? He's not, uh, scholars would say he's definitely not probably 26, 20, 27 yet. Probably in his early 20s, maybe 21, 22 years old at this time. And as, as anybody, again, that's, that's been around, we understand how, how it is to be a young man, things like that. At, at this point in Joseph's life, man, he's got some biological urges and drivings, you know, that are really, that are really kind of hard to deal with for a young man. Um, they say uh, psychologically and physiologically, uh, the, man, the, the brain of a young man does not fully mature until he's about 25 or 26 or 27 years old. And guess what the portion of the brain that, that uh, matures last is? The portion that deals with fear and consequences. Imagine that, right? So you got these young guys that are running around doing all these crazy things, cliff jumping, you know, joining the army, you know, shooting guns, doing all these crazy things, driving cars really fast. And while other, especially ladies and other older people that look at him and say, man, what's wrong with you? You know, be more responsible. And that's a lot harder for a young man of those ages because physiologically his brain's not developed yet to, uh, to really completely understand fear and consequences. They might feel scared, but they don't really understand com- the complete consequences of, of just whatever it could be, you know, whether it's getting into trouble or, or whatever. You know, they just, just don't quite understand it yet. So Joseph in this place, you know, that's kind of the place where he's at um, uh, in his maturity, physical maturity. Verse 7 says, um, and it came to pass, we just read that. Verse 8 says, but he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in this house, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. He's basically saying, you know what? The, my master's trusted me with everything. He doesn't ask me questions. He just knows that I'm always going to do the right thing. And it says, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. I'm responsible over all this stuff. Verse 9 says, there is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, that because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness uh, and sin against God. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. You know, it says he didn't even, even come close to that line. How many times have you heard young people say, oh, we're not doing anything bad. We're just holding hands. You know, have you heard that? We're not doing anything bad. That, that doesn't work. I, I mean, it's just, it just, it's not going to work. 
we're just holding hands, you know, we're, we're just going, we're just, you know, we're just getting, it's just, we're just hugging. He's just got my arm around me and things like that. that you know, it says here in verse 10, it says that, um, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her, right? He's not even wanting to even go uh, cross that line of even just being close to her, right? It says he just didn't do any of that. He just, he just left it. And it says, day by day, she spake to him. And again, imagine yourself in your early 20s again, and you got this woman, this rich, powerful woman that's talking to you day by day, constantly trying to put things in your mind. It says, um, day by day, she's, uh, verse 10, she spake to Joseph day by day, and he hearkened not unto her. Right? So day after day, he's being tempted. Day after day, she's probably following around the house, or, or who knows what exactly is going on. But we know Joseph, in his early 20s, is undergoing great temptation uh, now at this point. And then what, what does he say? He says, how can I do this great wickedness um, and sin against God? You know, you put yourself in the Christian life and we, you know, we see the writings of Paul and we say, how can we as a Christian, as a regenerated Christian, you know, go off and want to commit sin against the Lord? And we know it's easier said than done many times, but you have to put yourself in that question. You know, Joseph does not want to sin against God. He's more concerned about sinning against God than he is about himself, you know, and just maybe just a little bit of lapse of judgment. You know, you know, you know what I'm talking about, that reasoning. Maybe just once, so everything will be okay. No, he's very concerned. He doesn't want to sin, sin against the Lord. He's very concerned about that. Verse 11 says, And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. You know, so what happened? He noticed all of a sudden, he's like, where's everybody at? You know, I'm going in my house, I'm just doing, going about my daily duties, and, and all of a sudden there's nobody here in the house. Verse 12 says, And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Notice we don't see there any kind of argument, right? We don't see arguing. We don't see reasoning. He's already said, he's already gave her reason uh, where we see that in verse um, 8 and 9. He says, you know, my master made me, I'm, I'm in charge of all this stuff. You know, why am I going to go out and one, ruin it? You know, but, but two, you know, how am I going to sin against God? He's already gave her the reasoning of why he doesn't want to do this. But then all of a sudden here, he says, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. He left no explanation of what he do. He just took off. Ran away, right? Which is about the bravest thing he could have done. Many times that people of the world will look at people running away from sin and they'll say, you know, what, what coward is that? You know, are you not strong enough to deal with this? It's not cowardice, right? It's, it takes a lot of bravery to run away from sin. We know that. Man, running away from sin, running away from temptation, peer pressure, man, it's, it's a hard thing to run away from, right? Some will, some will try to stand and, and endure it, right? The Bible says in Psalms 1, don't stand, don't stand with sinners, basically what the Bible says. Don't stand there. You know, get out of that place. Don't walk with them. Don't do anything. It's one thing to, to, to be acquaintances with somebody like that. But guess what? When, when the partying comes down or whatever, you know, is sinful starts going on, it's best just to get out of there. Don't try to stand there and endure it and, and, and be a man or, or be strong or whatever. You know, just get out of there. Run away. Let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 2.22, which I think is a, a great verse that kind of that reflects this of, of Joseph's actions here. He says that she grabbed him by his garment and then he just he ran away. No explanations uh, needed. He just took off. 2 Timothy 2.22. It's a great verse to be memorized, I think, by just anybody, especially young people. Timothy. Uh, Paul wrote these letters to Timothy, and Timothy was a young man. And what he says to uh, Timothy he says, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, and, and them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. He says, Flee youthful lust. Paul doesn't say endure it. He doesn't say try to reject it. He doesn't say just, you know, just ignore it or avoid it. He says flee it. He says run away. He's telling Timothy, flee youthful lust. And we see Joseph here did the same thing. And now it comes to the point where it said, man, after, after this, this very trying temptations that, that Joseph's having to deal with, day after day, you'd think the Lord would say, you know what, Joseph, you've done really good. Here's a blessing. Let me give you your own household or, or what you, any, anything you can put in there. Let me, let me bless you in a great way, Joseph. What, but does that happen? No, we all know the story. It doesn't happen, does it? Let's look at verse 13. It says, And it came to pass, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. Um, where I leave off. And verse 15 says, And it came to pass, when he had heard that, Heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried, and he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. So what's, here, of course, we know this is a lie, right? But who, who is going to be believed here? The lady of the house or one of, one of the, the, the overseer servants, if you will? Well, of course, we know the lady of the house is going to be believed. Verse 16 says, And she laid up his garment by her until the Lord came, 
till his lord, or the master of the house, until he came home. And she spake unto him, saying, according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought unto us, came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left. Now what she's saying here, he says he came in to mock me. It's not just saying that he came in here to have this loving relationship with him. He came in here to basically really try to force her and take advantage of her. That's kind of the sense that she's giving to the master. It says he came in to mock me. Um, it says she laid up his garment by her. Excuse me, verse man. It came to pass. Um, lost my place. It came to pass when the master heard these words. Verse 19. Uh, of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant um, to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, uh, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. So what, he didn't, Joseph didn't just get put into any prison. He got put in the, the prison, right? The maximum security prison where all the king's prisoners go. Right, so Joseph, again, kind of going back, you would think Joseph just endured this great temptation. You know, he, he was victorious in it. He, he fled victoriously, right? That kind of sounds funny. Right, he fled the temptation, right? And guess, again, you would think maybe the Lord would bless him for it. But here, here's another twist in the story is all of a sudden now he gets put in prison. And you think, well, well God, where's the justice? You know, where's the justice of, of Joseph was trying to do the right thing? And look what happened. You know, why should I try to do the right thing? You know, but we don't see that attitude with Joseph, do we? Uh, we see Joseph that he continues to be blessed in all that he did. Verse 21 says, But the Lord was with Joseph. Here we again, we, we see that phrase. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. You know, God blessed Joseph even in prison, didn't he? We're going to see that uh, especially uh, next week in the next chapter. But the Lord continued to bless Joseph. You know, we can see that there, there, in my life, even there's been many times, if I can think of one specifically, um, when we were living in Ohio, we went to go move out to Oregon, you know. Uh, there used to be this question of, what, what's your plans, you know, because they knew I'd surrendered to preach. And at the time I was going to Bible school up there, they said, well, what's your plans? And I said, well, I don't know. And I had this one guy, he always liked to ask kind of, I thought they were stupid questions. But he would always say, well, what are you going to do if the Lord calls you to a third world country? I said, well, what do you think I'm going to do? You know, I, of course I would go, hopefully, I think I would go. And then, he would, then he would try to present a problem amidst that, you know, to try to refute what I just said. And he said, well, what, well you know, you don't walk very well, how are you going to deal with walking? You know, he would always bring up stuff like that to me. Trying, I'm thinking to myself, well, I'll let God worry about that. You know, that's the kind of answer I gave him. I said, you know, I'd let God worry about that. If the Lord wants me to go to a place, the third world country for a while, that's fine. I'll let him deal with the pains that I get when I walk and things like that. I don't, that's not up to me to decide, right? And that's kind of the answer I gave him. And sure enough, what happened? Lord, uh, we moved out to Oregon and shortly time after we spent a year in Peru. And that was honestly, it was kind of in my mind because I couldn't walk. I mean, I could walk, but there were times, I remember uh, one of the first times we got up there to, to Cajamarca in the mountains, uh, we wanted to go out there to, to the marketplace, which I don't know, it was about a mile and a half away maybe from where we were at. And I remember thinking to myself, like, man, I don't know if I can get down there, but you know what, I'm here, so guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm going to go. So here we go, and we got down to the marketplace. I remember I was tired when I got there. You know, I know we was looking at it, seeing the open marketplace, and it was, it was of course, neat to see and walk by a lot of the old places where I'd walk by as a kid. And uh, I remember walking back thinking, like, man, I don't know if I'm going to make it. But, you know, being kind of proud, maybe prideful about it. You know, of course, I got back, and I was tired when I got back. But I remember thinking that, you know, what am I going to do you know, if, you know, I end up staying here? But, of course, in the Lord's plan, we end up staying there for a year. And guess what? That, I used to get these pretty bad pains in, like, the front of my hip when I would walk, um, even when, before we went to Peru. And I, I don't get those anymore, thank the Lord. Um, you know, after being there, they, they kind of went away pretty quick. And um, now, of course, you all know that I'm studying to do a job where I'll basically be on my feet walking all day. You know, again, that's up to the Lord. But again, what, what would have happened if you take yourself back? What if I would have said, Lord, I, I can't stay here. I can't even walk very well and decide just to leave it. Not, not, not putting faith in the Lord to, deal, to handle those things, right? Maybe I still would have problems walking. I don't know. I can't, I can't go back and try to see what could have been. But one thing I do know is that the Lord did equip me for, for the, the time, that he, the place where he had me at the time. You know, I couldn't walk very well. It was, you know, I'd get a lot of pain from it. Guess what? The Lord equipped me to, to deal with that right in those times. And we can put that, we can, we can take that um, application, if you will, of that, that rule of thumb to imply it to so many different things in life. The Lord will equip you for whatever work he has ahead. Many times it doesn't seem like you're equipped, right? In my experience, many times you don't feel the equipping or the tools that the Lord supposedly gave you until you, after you've taken those first couple of steps in faith, knowing that the Lord is going to provide. And thankfully, many times the Lord does provide before you get there. But there's been times when, when, when you get to where you're supposed to be at, and you're like, Lord, what's going on? Where's, where's everything you're supposed to provide, right? You said you were going to provide, 
And now you have this decision to step out on faith, hoping that God's going to provide for you, or to kind of back out of it and say, well, the Lord didn't give me the tools I needed, right? And let me tell you, it's better to go ahead and just start stepping out because the, the Lord will provide. I mean, He always does. Not like He's not going to. You know, He always does. But again, we can apply that, that rule of thumb, if you will. I call it a rule of thumb because I think we should always live by it. We can apply it to so many different things in life. You know, I think it, when, when I think about this, I always think about Brother Johnson. Everybody, you know, we all, I know we have many questions. Why does the Lord let him go through that? You know, well, if we step back and we look at the will of God, we know that Christians are a preserving influence in the world, according to Paul, right? Whether it's through our prayers or whether it's just through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It was God's will, I believe, right? And I don't know God's heart completely. But when you look at Brother Johnson's situation, you say, well, maybe it was God's will for a preserving influence to be in that place. So what, what would God have to do? Take a perfectly sane person and throw him in there? No, that just doesn't work, does it? You know, I mean, they would, they would say, hey, you're fine. You're good. You can, you can go home. We don't have to take care of you anymore. But what he ended up doing, I, I believe he ended up equipping Brother Johnson in a way that he probably wouldn't prefer, right? But he equipped him for the, for the job that, he, that he's probably do, doing. Maybe he realizes it or not. I don't know. But one thing I do know, again, as Christians, we have a preserving influence uh, uh, in, in the world here. So, again, then you look at uh, other people with sicknesses. I uh, had that good friend in South Carolina. He had pancreatic cancer about four years ago. Beat it, but now he's actually starting to succumb back into it um, because it kind of came back. But one thing he always said was, you know what? The reason why the Lord let me get cancer is so I could go to the, when the, where they go do chemotherapy. And so I could be a, so I could be a Christian influence there. He would go and witness to people. He would go and they would sing praise choruses while he was sitting there doing his chemo. And, and I, I don't know this firsthand, but many times some of the chemo treatments are very difficult to go through. You know, just, just, those, just that time while you're hooked up to the machines or whatever, they, however they do it, you know, giving you the radiation and the chemotherapy, they say it's very difficult because you start feeling sick. Many times there's pain involved. But he said, amidst all that, I knew God had me here for reasons, so I'm going to take advantage of it, he would say. And he would go in there, he would sing, he would witness to people. You know, his wife would be in there. They would, they would bring uh, just, just a little thing, you know, music to listen to and things like that. And he said, you know, the Lord equipped me for this. But he said, you know what, if, if I never would have got cancer, guess what? I couldn't have just come in here and decided to do chemotherapy just on my own, on my own volition, could I? No. So the Lord had to equip him for the work that he was about to do, right? So again, we look at, we look at so many different things. You could say, well, why doesn't the Lord give me a billion dollars so I can go be a witness to Donald Trump or, or, you know, whatever. I mean, I guess it could happen, right? But at the same time, you know, the Lord's going to equip us for the work that he has for us, no matter what it is, whether it's making you lose some of your mind, you know, so you would go be a preserving influence in a place like Brother Johnson's is, which is what I believe, or get cancer so you can be a, a preserving influence and or a testimony to other people that are getting chemotherapy or just whatever it could be. You know what I mean? You can just apply, you can apply that to anything. So when we go through hard times, we always have to remember, guess what? The Lord's equipping us for this. You know, this is God's will, whether we like it or not. You know, it's God's will. And we just might as well just keep walking, you know, keep on going. And I wrote there, and sometimes God calls us a place that we don't understand, yet he blesses us. Sometimes he wants us to be able to relate to people with disabilities, so he prepares us for that work and blesses us there. Sometimes God wants us to be a preserving force in a mental health facility, I wrote, and so he equips us there and blesses us. You know, again, when God equips us for something, that just cheer people on, you know. They go through, they get disabilities, cancer, whatever it could be, you know. Cheer them on. You know, God's got a purpose. Verse 22 says, And the keeper of the prison committed to, to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. So, you know what, get, now, now the, 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 the um, who would this person be called, the, the master, the keeper of the prison, he, you know, he, he saw Joseph, he recognized there's something about Joseph, and guess what, he gave him responsibilities there, you know. Um, verse 23 says, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So the keeper of the prison knew that, you know what, I don't have to worry about anything with Joseph. Right? I just give it into his hand and everything's going to be taken care of, no matter what it is. Maybe Joseph had to oversee the cleaning of the, the, the bathrooms or whatever they had there, you know, that made sure all the prisoners got food. And uh, that maybe if there was a dead prisoner, Joseph would oversee the, the removal and disposal of the body. Who knows what it could be? But it says, if everything there in the prison that was going on, the keeper of the prison didn't worry because he gave it over into Joseph's hand and knew that there was going to be blessing because of it. You know, what's an interesting statement. So, you know, the, the big things I believe to take from this chapter is just the, the statements that the Lord was with Joseph. You know, you can insert your name there. The Lord was with Pauline. The Lord was with uh, uh, Sister Van Cleve. The Lord was with whoever, right? Brother Tommy. The Lord was with, with Sister Annabelle. Regardless of what's going on, that, 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 that statement and that promise still will always apply. The Lord was with so-and-so, right? The Lord was with so-and-so when they 
fell in, you know, had this tragic accident, right, and were paralyzed from the neck down, or whatever it could be. The Lord was with them regardless, right? And the other thing is that, you know, the Lord will equip us sometimes for jobs that we don't necessarily want to do, right? Sometimes, sometimes the equipping uh, is good, sometimes it's painful. But at the same time, you know, the Lord had got a reason for it, and there's a reason, you know, there's, God's will will always be done, right? you always be blessed for it. So uh, that's chapter 39. Next week, we get to look in to see the, uh, a couple different prisoners that Joseph got to interact with, right? Joseph gets his, we see Joseph getting his hopes up, and then he gets let down. Sorry, my, my lips are a little chapped. I feel like they're not moving right. Uh, but we see Joseph get his hopes up, and then he gets let down, right? We, we see that he, gets, he tells one, one prisoner, he says, hey, go tell Pharaoh that you know, I'm a good guy. And guess what? The prisoner, when he got out, they forgot about Joseph, right? And we see that a couple times. We'll get into that next week in chapter 40. Uh, but we're coming down to the last 10 chapters of, of Genesis. You know, it's kind of exciting to, to have gotten through all this far. Um, but um, we will continue with next week. Let's go ahead and pray. And we will get ready for the next part of service. Dear Lord, as we come to you in prayer, Father, we thank you for our Sunday school hour. Lord, we thank you for the encouragements that we see and the promises that, that, uh, that we see in the lives of these, these just other patriarchs, Lord, of the Bible. That you were with them, Father, no matter what. And that promise still holds through today. I pray, Father, that we'll, we will lean on that promise, Lord, that that will be one of the staple beliefs, Lord, if you will, in, in our lives. Lord, that you're with us no matter what happens. Uh, we love you, Lord, and pray that you'll uh, just be with those that, are, that might be on their way to the second part of service. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.